with um, asking you in Polish words to give, to give us a a sense of the story. You know how? Um, what is the story that this film uh, uh, tells, <coughs> and um, how is it that it was made in Italy? First of all, I, I wish to say I'm, I'm very happy to be here to, to discuss this wonderful movie. And it was, in fact, as Natalia Ingrimi just said, a, a movie that was completely forgotten for many ways and did not deserve to be forgotten. Uh, even in Italy, as she said, uh, we, we kind of lost track of this uh, important document. Uh, which is interesting, uh, in a way. What I will try to do very, very briefly is to present the, the background. Uh, I guess you are acquainted with the uh, context of uh, Palestine under the British mandate uh, right after World War II. What I, I think is less known and what I will try to illustrate briefly is the Italian context which is behind uh, this movie. Uh, there were, since after the war, several tens of thousands of numbers are not um, clear and precise, but uh, we can say at least 30, 40,000 uh, Jewish uh, refugees which uh, came from, well, uh, Eastern Europe mainly, who survived the Holocaust and who came into Italy. And uh, many of them later uh, went to Palestine, not all of them, of course. And many of them stayed in the Italian peninsula uh, for several years uh, within uh, uh, DD camps, uh, displaced persons camps, like the one shown in the movie. Um, this, uh, this presence, which is uh, conspicuous in terms of numbers and of the period which basically goes from 1945 to 1947-48 then most of them uh, leave Italy either to Palestine slash Israel or to um, other destinations many in the US, South America, etc. Very very few stay, stay in the country. Uh, the, the background, uh, which, which is interesting to note, is that uh, how, how do these people arrive in Italy? Well, actually, they're in many ways sent, guided to Italy, by, as we know, by the uh, soldiers, the Jewish soldiers in the, active in the uh, Jewish brigade within the British Army. Uh, as a group of those, uh, of those men, of those soldiers, who participated in the uh, Italian campaign during the, the end of the Second World War, who participated in the liberation of Italy. Once they, it, the country was liberated from fascist and uh, Nazi uh, occupation, um, well, they started doing a, a different job, even though they were supposed to um, act on behalf and follow orders from the uh, British Army within which they were operating, they started playing their own separate game. And uh, one of the, the key roles they played was to uh, guide these people, make them transit illegally inside the country, and once inside the country, uh, educate them and uh, stimulate them to appreciate the Zionist ideal and push them towards emigration, and furthermore, to organize illegal immigration from Italy to, uh, to Palestine of these, uh, of these refugees. In this context, uh, obviously we know that the, the, the British were, and the film shows it very clearly, uh, in, in opposition to Jewish immigration in Palestine for reasons concerning the uh, power relationship between the, the Jews and the Arab population in, in, in Palestine and the, the evolution of Britain's policy. So the British wanted to avoid, of, of course, this movement of people and uh, did all the best to, to exercise the political pressure uh, on the Italian government, which was slowly, slowly getting back its uh, autonomy and the control of the country those immediate
media to host for years. Um, and uh, what did the Italian government do? Officially, it said it was against the uh, entrance of these refugees in the country and against, of course, their leaving towards uh, Palestine in violation of uh, um, uh, the, the, British, uh, the British blockade. Uh, well, actually, uh, unofficially, the, uh, the Italian government supported this, uh, this movement of people. They tended to close an eye on illegal immigration into the country, and they tended to close an eye on the ships that were uh, taking off, uh, leaving from, from the Italian coast towards, towards Palestine. Um, this for, for, well, several reasons. One reason is that this was an instrument, even though small one, but still relevant in, in the immediate aftermath of the war for the Italian government to start developing its own autonomous Mediterranean policy in opposition to the British. Uh, the second instance is that um, the Italian authorities had great difficulty in stopping this flow of people that would come into the country. And at the same time, they did not want them to stay. So they were very happy that there were others that were organizing for their uh, departure. Uh, what, I, what I wish to say finally, very, very briefly, is that uh, these um, DP camps, uh, like the one like the one show, uh, were relatively closed, isolated. People could not move freely outside. So the contact with the local population was very, very limited. Uh, nonetheless, we have uh, several instances uh, reported by the police authorities of uh, sentiments of intolerance and anti-Semitism, prejudice in various forms that is um, uh, uh, shown by the by the local population towards these uh, towards these refugees. You have a whole set of typical anti-Semitic stereotypes. Uh, in general, you, you must consider the condition of a country that just came out of the war, that was in a very, very desperate economic and social condition, and in which the presence of other people uh, uh, who, who asked for help, who were looking for support, was, was a problem. Um, to, to this, you, you should add another factor, which may, may seem ridiculous, but uh, played a role. Uh, Italy in those years, 45, 46, 47, was marked by a strong, uh, divisive uh, uh, political struggle. There was, a, well, as you know, the anti-fascist alliance, which had contributed to the fall of the fascist regime, was, uh, uh, after the war, uh, rapidly disregated, and there was the communists and the socialists on the one side, and the Christian Democrats and the moderates on the, on the other side. Uh, there was a strong anti-communist uh, feeling, uh, especially inside the, uh, the police authorities, uh, which to, our, to our a large extent were the expression of the same administrative apparatus which had been in play during the fascist years. And so we find several, uh, several reports from local police authorities, from the prefects, uh, saying uh, to the government, we must be careful because these people that come from Eastern Europe could be emissaries of Stalin. Uh, this is ridiculous in itself. They, they were not emissaries of anybody, but it gives you uh, a little bit of insight on the well, paranoia that was uh, uh, typical of the time and of the difficulty in uh, facing the uh, facing the, the reality of what was going on. One last thing. Uh, the, the story of these refugees and of their short stay in Italy, well, not very short, a few years at least, uh, and of their departure from Italy is, well, very little known, uh, in fact. It's not only this movie that was forgotten, it's a whole story that kind of came out of the radar. Uh, historical research from an academic point of view has made uh, well, 
recently several steps forward, but there is still a, a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, of research to be done. Uh, I think one of the reasons why this this side of the Italian, uh, <laughs> this Italian side of the post-war uh, history uh, of, the, of the Jewish uh, 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 plight in, in the post-war it was forgotten basically because it doesn't fit in any of the main uh, uh, narratives on which uh, the, the Italian self-representation in the post-war was constructed. It, it has very little to do with the great anti-fascist narrative that has dominated the country afterwards. And in general, the, the issue uh, concerning these uh, these refugees, which came from from far away, was something that hardly fit, as I said, into uh, into the Italian uh, self-representation, which was built in those years and which has lasted very long and started entering into a crisis only only very recently. I think maybe it's not. Only, only by chance that just now we rediscover this movie, because we are starting to re reconsider those years, and Italian historiography has has been doing a lot uh, to look at the, at that period from with with a different lens. Um, perhaps it would be worthwhile adding a few words about these DB camps, because most of them, in the especially in the south. Um, where adaptation of what have been um, fascist concentration camps for foreign Jews who had not been able to leave Italy uh, with the decree of uh, 1939, which, um, with, with which the fascist government uh, decreed the, exp the expulsion of all foreign Jews from the country. So perhaps you want to say just a few words on how they became. Yeah, well. Some of these camps were, were adaptations of uh, uh, earlier internment camps, not only for Jews, but for a whole series of uh, groups that were uh, set to uh, those uh, to, to, to reside in those camps during the fascist period. Um, we must also consider that beyond the, the, the refugees that came from from Eastern Europe, there was. Uh, a local population of foreign Jews uh, that were residing inside Italy uh, since the, the 30s and which basically remained stuck in the country when, once the country uh, began its uh, racial and anti-Semitic campaign, and especially after the beginning of the, um, Italy's entrance into the war. So they were placed into these uh, internment camps and, uh, well, they they gained freedom when the, the British and the Americans freed uh, the country and, this, and they... Since 1943. What? In 1943. In, in yeah, since, since 1943, 1944, as the uh, Allied armies moved across the peninsula, they reached these camps and they liberated these people. But where would these people go? <laughs> basically, they had nowhere to go. They, they stayed there. And they had, well, basically two kind of new encounters which were meaningful uh, for them. One was with, the, with their American liberators, uh, and especially with the emissaries of the American Joint Distribution Committee, which uh, played a, a huge role in supporting even the, the very uh, life needs, uh, the ba very basic needs of these, of these people, and, uh, and as said before, by the soldiers in the Jewish Brigade. Uh, we have, we have meaningful data on the sentiments of the ideals and the hopes of these, <coughs> of this first group of, uh, of uh, um, foreign Jews present in Italy. And uh, we know that before the war, very few of them even thought of going to Palestine either or in any way close to the Zionist ideal. And m most were not even close to it right after their liberation. But uh, from, from, the, from the data we gathered, it's very clear that after the uh, education and propaganda activities from the Zionist emissaries of the Jewish Brigade start in the, in the camps, uh, the interest for Zionism grows and uh, the, there is a, a buildup of uh, emotions, hopes, and many of these people start 
to consider that as a, as a true option, even though certainly not all of them. To, to this group, which uh, is present in Italy and starts its uh, uh, interaction with foreign uh, Jewish groups, as I said before, uh, only later was added the, the, the other group of which I talked earlier that came from Eastern Europe, the survivors of the uh, German persecutions. These are two separate groups which uh, have, have a different, uh, uh, different histories and, uh, uh, but who, who basically end up uh, sharing these places, these physical places, these camps where they were uh, held up. And the camps were, uh, in many ways, after the liberation places for uh, rebirth of Jewish culture. Uh, education, I, I talked about Zionist <coughs> propaganda, that, that was relevant, but it's not only that. Uh, mm, at several levels, there was a, a rebirth of culture, and uh, uh, you must imagine these camps as places where people from all over Europe were gathered for a few years. And one of the things they did, which is very interesting, it's starting to be studied only recently, is they would set up historical committees to reconstruct on the basis of the testimonies they could gather in the camps of what happened during the war. And uh, these historical committees, not made by, by professional academic historians, but by people who had lived through the, through the tragedy, represent maybe the, the, the very first uh, instances in which uh, someone tried to, to reconstruct um, the, the history of the persecutions and to 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 um, uh, um, try to to understand what happened and the, that is a, a very very important uh, uh, passage and only only very recently it's starting to be to be studied uh, adequately. Thank you. I think it was just important to make this distinction because there is often a misconception about the overlapping of these two groups and the, the history of the Southern Camp after September 8, 1943 is obviously um, the history of, uh, is, is very different from the one that precedes and that follows. Um, Stefano Bertini, who is uh, an expert in the representation of history, Italian history through film, um, would Tell us about how you know about this film in terms of uh, of uh, how it fits in the cultural uh, scene of, uh, of Italy at that time. Well, there are a few things about this film that are sure and definite, and then there are a few mysteries that maybe tonight we can start to tackle. I'm not uh, expecting to solve them. But one thing that is certain is that this is first and foremost a neorealistic film. Uh, the date of production, 1948, distribution, 1949, it's right at the beginning. The normal, the, the dates that are considered canonical for the beginning and the end of neorealism would be 1945, Open City, and 1952, Umberto D. And there are many theories that say neorealism in Italy actually never ended. Uh, and, but these are the, the two canonical bookends of, of the movement, and of course this is right in the middle. And for any of you who have any uh, familiarity with neorealistic films, and I think it's most of you, uh, you can recognize almost all of the elements of the poetics of neorealism. And just a little parenthesis here, it's not that a group of directors or screenwriters met one day and decided, let's make neorealism. <laughs> and what are, you know, this happened, for example, with the Dogma School. They sat down and decided we're going to give ourselves roles we're going to abide by these rules. So if you want to be a member of our cinematographic movement, you accept these rules and you apply them and deploy them in the films. That never happened with neorealism. The set of rules that we uh, critics or viewers of these films uh, apply are rules that have been somehow deducted from watching these films. So I would say that this film has most of the features that we normally connect to the idea of neorealism. It's a mixture of professional and non-professional actors. Uh, all the non-professional actors were actual refugees that lived in camps and had to sneak out during the day for the uh, shooting of the film. Um, it's basically all shot outside. There, is, there are very few scenes inside. They didn't use any studio. Uh, 
They never went actually to Jerusalem. The Jerusalem you see here is actually the old town of Bali. And uh, every now and then you might have noticed that they put a postcard in front of it. And then they take away the postcard and all of a sudden you are in Bali and you think it's Jerusalem. So it's on location shooting, uh, natural light. Um, and also the themes. The themes are the themes of the early neorealistic films. And there is my colleague David Forgashi who devoted a lot, a lot of time to study not only New Realism but Open City. And I'm sure you recognize some direct quotations of that film that I'm sure all of you or most of you have seen from the moment in which um, one of the uh, refugees is taken away and he turns around and he's in between two soldiers and he screams, Ada, Ada, you substitute that with Pina, Pina, it's exactly the scene of the arrest of Francesco in Open City. And then of course, his Ada doesn't die running after a truck, but Judith dies after a truck when she tries to throw the grenade and she's gunned down. So there are not only the elements of the poetics of neorealism, but there are direct citations of Neorealism, and of course, of the uber neorealistic film that is Open City by Roberto Mussolini. Um, so, this is just to set the tone. So, this is 100% a neorealistic film shot in Italy by an Italian director with an American writer, not talking about Italian history and not talking. That's the only violation of the poetics of neorealism. Neorealistic films had to talk about the situation, especially of the lower classes in Italy after the end of the war. So the, it's the subject matter that differs. And one more thing that differs is that whereas in neorealistic films, and let's refer again to Open City for the sake of the consistency of the argument, it's very clear, even in a Manichaean way, that the good are all on one side and the bad are all on the other side. Uh, to the cost of somehow forcing the actual historical truth uh, in Rossellini's open city, it seems that there are almost no bad Italians. The Italians are all pretty much good or indifferent, but the bad guys are all the Germans. So you leave with the sense of a solid sense of the good is all on one side, the evil is all on the other side. But I feel that this film also differs from that in the sense that you are left with open questions. And I think it's very interesting that still now, after uh, six years, we still are left with questions. Who are the good people and who are the bad people? Uh, these three friends that find themselves uh, only a few years after the end of the war that they fought on the same side against the Nazis and the fascists are on different parts of the spectrum. And you might sympathize with one more than the other, but can you really say that George, the British captain, is a bad guy? Um, that he's portrayed as a bad guy in the film that is even more important, more interesting. Not completely. Not completely. You, you're left with, with it. I mean, it's not the almost caricature-like representation of the Nazis that you have in uh, Open City, you know, smoking cigarettes and, and trying fur coats that were taken from the people that were deported. I mean, there are, it's, it's uh, stripped down of all these stereotypical elements. And then there are some mysteries, and we were discussing them before with Wendy. You know, if you look at the beautiful uh, Locandina, that was printed in the States when the film was released here. It says, produced by Albert Salvatore, and Wendy's gonna tell us something about this guy, uh, written by Louis Gittler, directed by Guido Coletti. So, written by Louis Gittler. If you look at other sources, there seems to have been like a busload of people participating in the writing of this film. And it was a pretty interesting busload of people. Because among others, you have Carlo Levi, that many of you remember probably as the author, immediately after this, of uh, Christ Stopped at Eboli. And uh, Alessandro Fersen was a Jewish-Polish refugee 
that had very adventurous life, participated in the resistance, and he became later one of the most prominent figures for the innovation of theater in Italy. Um, Duilio Colletti is credited with the subject. Duilio Colletti is basically the person who physically wrote all the Fellini's films. So if you look at this, uh, at, at this Locandina, made for the American distribution, only Mr. Gitter is credited. If you look at other sources, there are four people, and then all of a sudden on IMDb, there is also Maria Berardi that is credited with the story. And that's the first time I've heard of the name, or I've seen the name associated with the writing of the film. So there are many aspects of this film that are still very important. There are many aspects that probably need to be clarified and for which maybe research uh, should be done. Um, but, but I think the most important thing, and it might also explain uh, the reason why, that's the other mystery I was talking about, and, and Guri referred to it. I mean, Guri is an expert of this topic. He's, he's been working on it for a long time. I, I thought I had watched all the, all the films of Neorealism, and David probably thought that too. And all of a sudden, we see this film that completely was gone, forgotten. So that's the other mystery. Why did that happen? Uh, the Cineteca Nazionale restored the copy. It was presented at the Festival of Venice two years ago. Uh, and that's the, why most people at least have heard of it. Uh, but it was brought to my attention by Wendy, who came to an event we had on, on the refugees of Cinecittà. We presented this beautiful documentary. She said, my father wrote a film about more or less the same topic. And I was wondering, what film could that be? And, uh, and that's how um, we were able to, uh, thanks to Natalia, to get the film and have it subtitled and then brought it to our attention. But it, it still remains a fact that it, a film that you can judge as you want from an artistic point of view, but you cannot definitely undermine the value of this film as a historical document and a cinematographic document uh, of extraordinary importance has been so overlooked and almost forgotten for all these years. So that's a further point of, of reflection and a further question that I, I, I put on the table. That the hypotheses are many, you know, and I think that what I said before that it really escapes the manichaeistic view of having good and bad very solidly divided could be one of the reasons. Um, many realistic films leave you with this feel good feeling. You walk out of this film, you don't have the feel good feeling. A uh, cozy thing of seeing, oh, now we're all on the same good size. It, it's, a, it's a film that triggers uh, questions and doubts. At least that's the effect that it provoked. Them. And then, of course, there are the more obvious political reasons. It's a film about the, basically the foundation of the state of Israel, or the beginning of the state of Israel, with all the politicization uh, connected to it that we are uh, all very familiar with. So that's a further reason that might justify or somehow explain, at least partially, uh, these oblivion. It has not been a popular topic in Yeah, <laughs> for another years. part of Europe, yes. And we're just talking about the fact that the campus of Chinichita, which closed in 1952, um, it was, it's basically an unknown story, has been erased from the memory of Romans. So even though um, I actually remember family members talking about it when I was a child, but the general public had no idea that it existed. So, and this is, uh, so I just want to say, this is the first time I see the film on a big screen, and I, I see Alessandro first, and actually there are very specific citations from a couple and, of and theater also, plays that- And he also acted it. Yes, and, but the, there are say, visual citations from yeah. the real Edwards and, and other and two plays that he made in, uh, in 1946, so it's, uh, um, and perhaps, I, I don't know why, I you know, uh, we don't really have evidence about that Levy may have um, participated, but it was an obvious call uh, since he had been interned uh, in one of the camps in southern Italy. So now we come to how this story was born, because uh, um, in spite of all this mystery, there was one man who followed uh, the refugees and had the idea of, uh, of uh, making this film, who wanted to tell this story, and it was Lewis Hitler. And uh, <laughs> Wendy will uh, tell us a little bit about 
her father's life and, and experience as a journalist uh, in uh, pre and, uh, and post-war Europe. Uh, well, can you hear me now on this? Because I'm better talking without it, but OK. Um, first, I want to thank both of you, uh, Natalia and Stefano, for everything you've done. And I want to thank Maria Nazor because I talked to her many times about, I want to find my father's film. And then one day she said, ah, it was in the Venice Biennale. Mm -hmm. And then, then in the, Israel. It, in Israel. Was, well, it played in Israel, or, but yes, but, yes. And it was such a surprise to me <coughs> because I had a copy long ago and it disappeared. And it was, of course, the old 16 millimeter reel, so this is a whole new world. Anyway, I want to speak about um, my father's past because I think this very much reflects um, how finally such a film, he, he would have pursued such a film. And I was thinking of the old Chinese adage about may you live in interesting times. And my father's life does read almost like a novel. And he lived through so many major events that I could see where this could be, have been a culmination, at least, of the end of the war uh, period. Maybe a culmination in a certain way for all his very vivid experiences. Uh, he was born in Chicago in 1914. And uh, his family had come from, his father was from Silesia. His mother was from Lublin, Poland. And uh, his mother had come to America at a young age and then gone back, met her husband, the elaborate story at some border after she had come back from America, said she wanted to live in an English-speaking country. <laughs> and they went first to uh, London and then Toronto, and they ended up in Chicago. And in Chicago, uh, my grandfather, I don't know quite how, as a gambler, an entrepreneur, built a big hotel uh, called the Southmore Hotel and became a millionaire. <laughs> and uh, this is the 1920s. And there was jazz played there. And my grandfather also would gamble in some of the rooms. And all his four children had suites in the rooms, as well as having a mansion on the south side of uh, Chicago. Uh, they went every summer to see the relatives of both of them. They went to Baden-Baden and Europe and uh, went to Egypt once. He traveled, so my father had a knowledge somewhat of North Africa. Um, and uh, they lived the high life of the 20s. And then in 1927, my grandfather invested in wheat futures. He took the money from the mortgage of the house, his children's, for his children, and the money for his children's college education and trust funds. And lo and behold, it was a bad crop that year, and all the money went, went was gone. And so uh, he left. And my grandmother had to support the four children. And my father then went to the University of Alabama, where he stayed a year. And then he went um, to the University of Chicago for a while, where he studied or did research. The, it, there were not degrees there. He just went here and there, almost in a migratory path. And he, uh, I was speaking to my sister the other day, and we were trying to think of the name. And finally, it came up, uh, Harold Laswell who was very involved in propaganda and many things. And he did the research for him without any degrees. These were the years of a porous and open kind of education. People didn't have to go through the strict path. They somehow picked up their knowledge through all, many, many different channels and avenues. And so my uh, aunt um, realized there was really money problems. And she spoke German fluently. And she somehow got involved in a a Berlin topics, a newspaper in Berlin, and called for her brother to come there. Mind you, my father at this time is 19, 20, 21, 22. So it's very amazing, too, because usually young people today, we start talking about their lives when they reach 30 or 40. But here I'm speaking about a person of 17, 18, 19, you know, right through the 20s, uh, who lives a very active a political and social life uh, with the main events taking place. And so he goes to Berlin, and he writes for this newspaper, and he gets in somehow to the what was called the Hochschule für Politik. It was the not Goebbels Nazi propaganda school, and he passes as a, as a German, and he has the most amazing education in terms of methods of propaganda 
in order to slowly uh, build up the German morale between after the First World War and then finally also the anti-Semitic program that exists there. And with this information, he writes notes and eventually he gets together with Lazaro Fargo. I don't know, is he here? John Fargo, are you here? Oh, the way in the back there. Gets together with Lazaro Fargo and uh, they um, work on a book called German Psychological Warfare. And it's published in 1941 in New York. Um, okay, just, uh, uh, also, at this time, he hears uh, that Emma Goldman in Spain uh, needs a secretary, goes to Spain during the Spanish Civil War. The job doesn't pan out, but I mean, so he's here and he's here in all the momentous occasions. I have hundreds of letters that he wrote and notes that he wrote. I'm not going to read them now, but they are amazing letters about Europe in not from the in the 1930s, and they may be. Put, you mentioned that they could. Yeah, we will um, make them available. Some of them available through our website, our online publication, print and matter. Uh, so what happens is he comes back. Uh, he, by the way, he meets my mother on a boat, one of the boats. She's going back to Lithuania, where she was born, to see relatives. He meets her on one of the boat trips back and forth. And um, he doesn't marry her until he comes back here in 1937. Uh, and um, he comes back to this country around 1937. And um, he has no degrees. He has, he has very little to really have all this experience behind him. And um, I don't know quite during those years he wrote articles. But then when the war, the war years begin, uh, the, because of his book, which was published in 1941, German Psychological Warfare, and because of his knowledge of languages, uh, the, o, the OWI, the Office of War Information, calls him to Washington. They train him to uh, eventually go to Europe. They, he goes to London to prepare for this. And what the, he does in the Office of War Information is he uh, is behind the troops, and he goes to Europe with the invasion of Normandy, and he's behind the troops, and any German prisoner of war, he, um, he interrogates to get information from them, and then the towns that are conquered, he goes and speaks to all the inhabitants, and he tries to reorganize the, the villages, and uh, get a new go democratic gover from government for them. And in the letters are all the descriptions of what Europe was like, and it's extraordinary descriptions of what things were like going into these villages that where the war had been fought. Um, and then uh, after, a little bit later, after the war is over, he goes to Germany to denazify the villages. I remember as a child, he also talked about there was one village of all rats lived there only. So he had to go on to the next. I mean, each, each village is, is an amazing mirage. It's like a tableau, like a painting, practically, the way he describes it. Uh, and uh, in these villages, he eventually is looking for someone for to become the new prime minister president of Germany. And uh, he finds Adenauer, who was clean of a Nazi past at that time, and so um, He's involved in the reconstruction, in some way, of, of denazifying Germany. Um, and what happens then is in uh, 19, it was 1946, he calls for his family to come to Europe. He becomes a foreign correspondent for Life and Time magazine. And he writes many different articles. One he wrote about Hitler and Eva Braun, because they found her diaries. And uh, he works for Life and Time in Berlin. And then he goes, we go to Paris in 1947. And there he meets uh, Albert Salvatore, who he had known during the war. And um, they discuss somehow or other to do something about uh, the whole idea of the war and the development and the, um, the, the, the aspect of Israel, the whole whole situation. So they become good friends. Albert Salvatore is uh, an Italian-American from the Abruzzi. Uh, he has a wealthy brother in California who can finance things in the oil business. And uh, he knows a lot of contacts. And uh, when they, um, when my father finally goes to Rome in 1947-48, 
Uh, they go to the Lux Film headquarters, and there uh, they present some of the ideas they have been working on. Uh, my sister claims that Meyer Levin might have had some suggestions uh, with the whole plot also, because he's a friend of Meyer Levin's. Uh, there are many, Saul Padover, by the way, the dean of the New School, uh, was with my father during the, the time when they went back to um, Germany to try to denazify the villages, and he, he went around with him. And so there are a lot of people that are later play a big role here in America, but who play a pivotal role uh, right during the war and, and after the war. Um, and let me just see. Uh, there, there's, it, it, it's very hard to summarize a life that's so full of, at that time. I'm just trying to carry it in my, in my limited time here. Uh, there's a lot of things I've, I've left out. In any case, when we finally come back to America in 4950, um, it's very anticlimactic for many of the people who have been uh, living this life without stopping, uh, who have been living a life with, with, um, uh, with the rise of Hitler, with the Second World War, uh, with Europe after the war, to come back to America. And uh, it's that kind of atmosphere that made, he found it very difficult to somehow adjust to a life without peril and without danger and without, and um, he, he, has a, he, he, he has an art collection from Europe. Uh, he does some writing, different forms of writing. He works eventually for the German Information Center. He works first in public relations and then the German Information Center, where he started a magazine, German American Review, and did a film on Adenauer and Kokoschka's friendship, and also did a film earlier on about the French cowboys in the Kamar. But this film was really a culmination of having seen the horrors of the, the, the buildup in, in Germany of, um, of the Nazi beginnings, the Jewish fate. He also worked with his sister to save uh, German Jews, sending their money out to different countries, uh, getting them visas. So he was involved in that whole process during the years before the, the war started. And then, um, having seen the front, having seen the dead soldiers, having seen the concentration camps, having interrogated many Germans, it, he understood um, the, the, the whole background for the raison d'etre of the desire to have a state for the Jewish people. And so, I mean, I really see it as a help. And, and in the end, there is this hope, you know, can it, can it come to be? Uh, can it be a possibility? So, um, I mean, that gives you a little bit of the background. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So glad that uh, uh, the issue of refugees uh, since the Avian Conference has been one of the major, major um, issues of the foreign politics. Um, for the United States and uh, other European countries and was largely uh, linked to uh, the Sanitism and the uh, flight. Sounds like a boat. Uh, <laughs> Jews from Europe. So, in a way, it's a, it's a film that addresses very, very early on, with very fresh eye, um, something that because of the the way in which, you know, of course, in 38, 39 things oh, were very different. Um, but something that was a difficult, difficult topic to address and that later on, I think, it becomes more diffused in the, in the, in the culture. Now, uh, we will accept a few questions. Um, I have, I, have a, I have a request. I know that everybody has many things to say, but uh, in the interest of uh, making the most of having our wonderful panel speakers here, I ask you to turn any comment you have into a question. If you cannot turn it into a question, uh, then please postpone it to a post-program uh, conversation. Thank you very much. Please. Uh, Natalie, since we have the fortune of having uh, David Forgage in the audience, 
is sort of half in hiding, but he's a real expert on neorealism, and I'm really interested in, in calling him up and asking what he thought of this movie. It's the first time you see it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to cut into people's time, but actually, luckily, no, for you, I have to go in about three minutes because I did be summer at Hot Buzz Day, so I just give you two or three very quick reactions to this, and then I'll let you get on to your questions, which really are questions. Uh, I think the first thing is it hasn't come up in the discussion because you were, you had rather different agendas. Just to look at the way this film works uh, emotionally. Uh, I mean, it does start really with this private story of the two women and the two men. Uh, so it's constructed, I think. It is a, I agree with uh, Stefano, a neorealist film. It does have these references back to an urban city. But because it's an American scripted film, which comes outside of the Italian film world, it's also drawing another filming traditions, one of which I think is melodrama and uh, a love story. Um, so the, the kind of basic plot thing which gets the story going, of course, is this divided loyalty uh, of David to his former lover, um, Dina, and his new lover, Judith. And what happens, of course, in the, in the film is you establish these two couples, the, the David, uh, the new couple, which is uh, Dina and Aria. And the, old, and the other couple, which is David and Newton. So it's very much constructed around the tension of other personal story. I think it's very clever the way then the political narrative, which is the second narrative, is interwoven with that. Uh, I mean, it is, I think, essentially a Zionist film. Uh, it's very clear about the ideology. The, the only real split is whether uh, it's, it's legitimate to use violence or whether one should not use violence. There's a very strong um, sort of tension about that in the film. I think it's very, very well constructed as a drama. I think uh, you know you may not shed, not be sympathetic to David's commitment to the use of violence, but you're very sorry for him. Uh, very sorry for him, I think, and, and, and for his father when he's hanged. So the way this culminates in the double execution of the two men, who of course were friends in Italy, um, is a very very powerful way of putting one in the position of saying what is the morally correct thing to do in this political situation. What, well, of course, the film doesn't really go into, I think I agree with Guru about this, is that there isn't a, a, um, a really contextualization of British policy. Uh, there's no sense of what the position of the Palestinian Arabs is. They're simply not in this story. So, of course, it's a very, um, in some ways, a one-sided representation of what's going on politically. Um, final thing, because I already have one, one minute, is just to say that I think technically it's a very interesting film. Um, it's very interesting to hear from Wendy about how it was produced because obviously quite a lot of money went into this film. I'm not sure how the funding was raised, but um, it's not cheap to shoot on location. It's usually cheaper to shoot at studios. Um, so uh, this amount of location shooting, using actors who were well known, so Vivi Joy, uh, Ninki, uh, who else is there? Uh, Marina Berti, who of course is the lead who plays in Quo Vadis. She plays Eunice because she speaks English and Italian. These were people who established their acting career already in the fascist period, and they were well-known actors. Um, Alessandro Ciccolini, who wrote the music, of course, also wrote the music for Bicycle Thieves. Right, so I think incredibly interesting score. You probably notice the bits of God Save the King coming in both in the, like the overture, over the, over the credits, and um, when the British arrive to do the lineup that plays very ironically. So I think a very, very clever and moving score uh, by Ciccolini. Uh, it's the, the, the editor is Mario Serandre, who was the editor for Ossessione and a whole number of near this films. So they've got a very, very good crew and a very good group of people. It's a very professionally made film. Um, and I don't know, that's about it, I think. That's to say that I, I, my first reaction is Thank to think it's an extreme piece of, uh, piece of cinema. Thank you. Thank you. We have one question here. He answered one of my questions because I was going to ask about who did the musical scores and how it related to neo-realism. So that answered my question. I just wanted to, um, I don't know how to make this a question, but um, the idea of the new of uh, ambiguity between good and bad, it was very clearly stated by the doctor, David's father, in the beginning of the movie when the woman runs out and screams and accuses the man in the camp. And he, he says you can't judge, you don't know what he's been through, you don't, and that's really sort of is the theme at, at the end as well, about the good and evil. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to clear up something for myself. Yes. The captain, 
Now, who was he? Was he an Italian sympathizer, or was he an agent of the Israeli? No, the captain is an Italian British captain. Italian. Sympathizer. No, no, he's not. He's an hired Italian. by the. The oh, it was just hired. He's hired by yeah. the This was uh, this had happened all well, along. Uh, if, he's, if he's hired, he's in a sense sympathetic to the cause. Well, it seems that there is a sort of a, 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 con a conversion process of the captain during the journey, and he becomes more, he's, he's pretty brusque at the beginning, and he becomes more and more involved with the stories of these people, when he sees them getting married, he sees the sick lady, and at the end he gives this statement, I'm going to come back on a big transatlantic boat like the ones I used to have with the flag of my country on it. Of course, he's referring to the Italian flag. And he says that he's going to bring, not refugees, but he says, Colony. colonizers. And Guri, you might want to say something about that. Yeah, very, very quickly. Um, the, 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 the presence of this Italian captain and the Italian crew of the whole ship uh, who are employed for the, for the job reflects what we know of what really happened. Uh, the, the ships that left from Italy were, were manned uh, by, by Italian yeah. sailors. Um, there is also another thing, uh, the, the figure of this cat uh, fits perfectly within the, the rhetoric of the good Italian. He's, uh, it's, as you said, he, he has a conversion process and at the end he, he, he basically sacrifices he the ship. The land from he, gets the land. <laughs> he gets the land. He gets the land. He gets the land. He, gets, he, gets, it's, 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 he sacrifices his ship. I mean, for, for a captain to sacrifice his ship for, for these people, he, he didn't know. And he receives a quintessential sacrificial animal. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> no, he, he, that's, that's interesting because it's the only thing that fits into the Italian cultural context is the, the image of the good Italian. All the rest relates to a, to a different story. But that is, is perfect. It, it's uh, how do the Italians fit within the, the, the history of the Jewish persecution and uh, the birth of Israel? They're the good guys that help. That's it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your question. Yes. Um, just two questions. One is, how was this film received in Italy and in the US? And secondarily, what happened to your father after he did this? Did he stay involved in, in cinema and several things? Well, I, yeah. I, I had answered before. I said he did do a few films. He did one before, and then he did one of Kokoschka and Adenauer, and he uh, did writing. He worked you know, for German Cultural Review and various things when he came back to this country. But the movie had a lot of problems, and I think we can probably only see it properly today because uh, it, it, it had mixed reviews, and I think my father was very disappointed here, very mixed reviews. It was shown in Israel, too, I know. It. Well, I don't know what happened there, but I know it did show there. But I think America wasn't ready, really, at that time to understand the implications of the birth of, of Israel, to understand the implications of refugees. I, I don't think that it was rather, I, I, the atmosphere wasn't ready. That's, you know, that's Interesting. It seems to me that a lot of the things that in, in the movie Exodus that was done so much more successfully later, it, this was almost like a precursor mm -hmm. to Exodus to me. But more authentic. So, this is filmed, you know, with the actual refugees and with action and, and in location at least closer to than, than the Hollywood version. Yes. 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 Yes, I wanted to know the other Italian films of that period. Did they talk about Auschwitz? Did they talk about the cleaning out of the ghetto in Rome, which are both in this movie quite present? And for example, Primo Levi couldn't even sell his book in those years. Um, it seems to me he's a little bit ahead of the curve, Mr. Hitler, in, in bringing these subjects into the popular uh, representation. Well, or not. <laughs> There was something, but not a lot, not in that period. Huh? Mm -hmm. Things will come out slowly later. Uh, Could you repeat the question, please? Now, no, she, she asked if uh, the, the issues of concerning Jewish persecution, and the movie talks about, for example, the uh, Roman Jews being deported, were issues present in Italian cinema at the time. And well, not very much. Actually, very, very little. You have sometimes in these nearest films uh, 
which basically talk about the Italian resistance, uh, the Nazi occupation. Sometimes you can have a figure of the Jew, of the persecuted, but it's a very uh, small figure generally that makes a small, short appearance and that, that whose function is to, to uh, highlight the, the, how evil the Germans are and how good the Italians are, basically. That. But they're never, and as far as I know, in that moment, they're never the protagonist no. of a story. No, you're right. Yeah, the, the short answer to your very interesting question is no. Uh, it was a removed memory. And if you look at the diary of uh, survivors and of people, even that if they were not uh, survivors of concentration and extermination camps, but for example, if you read the, the diary of Carla Pichelis, my version of the fact that has also been published in this country, uh, she says that after the war she goes back to Rome, and people ask, well, where have you been? <laughs> and you know, the, she has gone through this ordeal to leave Italy and then in Portugal and then waiting for the papers and then coming to America. And it's like, it's a removed part of national memory. And I think that the most important function, political and social function of neorealism, was somehow to bring Italians together. That's why Rossellini, aside from personal reasons, uh, presents this uh, very manichistic view of uh, Italy during the war, saying the Italians, after all, were all pretty good. Well, if you start talking about the persecution of the Jews and the internment and the extermination, you need to deal with that in a deeper way. You, need, you really need to dig the topic in a different way. And I believe that's one of the reasons why, for a very long time, you don't have, in Italy, and we have to say, in other places, uh, films about uh, the Holocaust. And what you said about Primo Levi waiting to publish his book is totally true. And you can imagine, when it comes to films, that for a, for a production company, it's not like putting out a book for a publisher. It's a huge cost. So this was a part of Italian history that made many, many people uncomfortable. And that's why even neorealistic films that have great merits for many other reasons, but they never tackle this one. What are your thoughts on the movie Auto di Roma? Well, you know, that's, that, that's an interesting film. It brings out a, a piece of, uh, of history that, that has been, uh, uh, that is true. Um, uh, but again, you know, the Italians, after all, they are represented in a, in a very positive way. I mean, they seem to be on the part of the Jews helping out, collecting the gold that is needed to prevent what eventually will happen anyway. So, it, 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 and it doesn't deal with the Holocaust. There are no scenes from extermination camps. It once again, it's reiterates this rhetoric of Italiani per la gente that when faced with the persecution of fellow human beings, they stand up and help. In this case, collecting the gold necessary. So even that film. And the, and the central point is a dance with this joining the resistance, and the, I mean, the end of the film is really. Something it, it says uh, you know that uh, somehow to be be Jewish does not um, belong in one way or the other, either as a victim or uh, not. Uh, what that uh, becomes is a partisan. I'm ashamed to say that the Garden of the Fruits and Pantinis was the first thing that opened my eyes to what was going on in Italy. Yes, for many people. That was the case for many people. But once again, it's a, it's a film in which uh, there is only a very, very slight reference at the end when the tennis camp, if you remember the last scene of the Finzi Contini, uh, thanks to the beautiful photography of the film, is suddenly transformed from a place of, uh, like a Garden of Eden, that it was at the beginning when the film begins, uh, these fence, barbed wire, is reminiscent of the gates of the camp. But again, it's only uh, referred to, it's only a, a visual figurative hint, much rather than the, it, it, it stops at the threshold of the concentration camp. It doesn't get in. It tells you, I mean, it's, it's a, there are lots of premonitions about the end of the Finzi Contini, of Nicole, and of their friends. Uh, but it really stops on the, it's very, I think it's very meaningful that it stops on the threshold 
of the cab and it doesn't get in. Since, since you mentioned the Vinci Contini garden, so I, I couldn't help but think of uh, one of the earliest short stories by Giorgio Bassani concerning this issue. Uh, I think it, it's a very beautiful short story that helps us understand the uh, cultural setting of the immediate post-war. The uh, short story tells uh, about this Italian Jewish man from Ferrara who had been deported and he survives and he comes back to his, his hometown uh, and he comes back and he sees his name on a plaque with the name of the dead Jews from Ferrara and he said, hey, I'm here, I'm not dead, but he, he's a ghost. He's actually a ghost. He doesn't fit into that, that city, that society. His, his own home now belonged to the uh, National Liberation Committee, which had become the headquarters of the anti-fascists. And they didn't want, didn't want to give him back his home. They said, what are you doing here? We thought you were dead. So, so he, he does not fit in any way. Even the anti-fascists seem not to, to be receptive. And, um, and in the end, the short story tells about how he, he went to the, the local cafes and to the streets to talk to people, to tell them what he, he, he had been through. And at the, in the beginning, they were, they were all surprised, so he was the, the, the big star in the city. It was something incredible. But after a few days, nobody really wanted to hear his story. Uh, nobody was really interested. And the, and the novel uh, ends with the, this character vanishing out of Ferrara, like a ghost. He, he has somehow his social role, but he completely vanishes. And the interesting thing is that uh, the novel is based on a true story. It's based on a, the story of a, of a cousin of, a, of Bassani, who indeed had been deported and had survived. And when he came back, he actually saw his name on the, on the plaque and whose house had indeed been uh, occupied by the National Liberation Committee. So this, this, this short story, I think, tells us a lot about the immediate uh, uh, post-war climate, how it was impossible to, to um, in many respects, to, to face the, that kind of, uh, uh, of events. Um, what, what do you know about the, Itali the Italian Jews that were deported or interned? And did, did some of them, did they return to Italy? Did some go to other countries? And I'm also curious if, if there were many Italian Jews that went to Palestine. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have uh, around 6,000 Jews, uh, um, Italian Jews deported from Italy to um, Nazi concentration camps. Of these, uh, a very small number survive. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it's about one tenth. Uh, one, one out of ten, more or less. Uh, mm, the, the internment uh, you mentioned is a different story. Uh, we, we really have to, to distinguish between German concentration and extermination camps and Italian fascist internment camps. Uh, this is not to say that fascist anti-Semitism was not uh, a very terrible thing and that we must not conceive it in its uh, authenticity and understand it and study it. But it's simply a different thing. Fascist anti-Semitism did not lead to extermination. It did not plan extermination. Uh, having said that, the, the other question you, you asked was uh, those, how many went to, to Israel or Palestine. Very few, uh, at least in, in the immediate post-war years. We, we have a, a continuous, as from everywhere, a continuous flux of it. Jews from Italy, like from France or from the USA, going even today. But if we look at the immediate post-war years, the numbers are very small. Uh, out of about 40,000 Italian Jews present in the country in 1945, you have uh, about 3,000 that leave for Palestine uh, between 45 and 48, uh, of which 70% come back to Italy after four or five years. Um, why? Because life was much easier. <laughs> no, really. I mean, the, the quality of life you would have uh, in, in Israel would be much lower if you 
didn't have a really strong ideological commitment, it was very hard. It was war. Yeah, yeah well, it was war, but, but it's not only war. I mean, the, 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 the whole lifestyle. Uh, there is one letter from one of these that is very young. He, he, he leaves uh, in, um, right in 1945, at the beginning of 45. He was a Roman Jew, and he writes home to his father, who was absolutely contrary to his leaving, leaving and he said, Look, Father, I think you were right. Here there are people who have PhDs and so on, and they work uh, uh, building roads and uh, other what he considered uh, not very prestigious employments. And uh, after a few months, he comes back. And then many do that. It's, uh, the other issue is that many did not perceive, perceive Italy and Italians as hostile. Uh, that has to do with the whole perception of the recent persecution. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if any attention has been paid in Italy to the efforts of the Italians in Nice to rescue Jews um, before Italy changed sides. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a. Uh, a very well-known story uh, was started being studied right after the war by Leon Polyakov and other French historians. Now, uh, th there is a, uh, a big problem there. Uh, from, from the beginning, a great scholar like Polyakov, he was, he was very young when he, he wrote his essays on the Jews in Italian-occupied France, uh, he's very uh, determined in saying that the Italians were good people, morally good people. But his goal there, uh, this, this publication, is, I think, from 47 or 48, I don't remember exactly, uh, is to show that instead the French were not, uh, had not been as good. The, the world, symbol, you must understand that the symbolic representation of the good Italian and of the bad German has uh, uh, a function in, uh, as it allows other, a whole of, uh, other figures to position themselves in respect to these two uh, opposite sides. So uh, Polyakov is very keen in um, putting in uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, highlight uh, Italian merits. And there are, I mean, Italian uh, forces occupying southern France, also Greece and uh, Yugoslavia, uh, did in many cases resist German pressure to give in Jews for deportation. Does this mean they were good? I don't know. Uh, I think this simply means that the Italian political authorities had different policies. Mm, not that, <laughs> I don't know if you, if you get the, the, the issue, is that we have uh, come out of a long period in which the fascist anti-Jewish policy has been represented as morally good. Now, I don't want to get into what is good and what is bad. I think that to understand what happened, we basically have to understand that simply Italian uh, policies were different and the Italians wanted to show the Germans that they were in charge. And not giving them Jews was a way to, to measure the power. It does not reflect necessarily the fact that they were good. It's simply that they had a different policy toward Jews and the will to uh, testify their uh, sovereignty on these territories. Question? Um, yes, in, uh, in the first place, Wendy, I think this was an extraordinary film. It was, it was very daring for its time in that uh, films about, not about victimization, not about good and bad, but films about the future of the Jews were, very, were few and far between. Um, there's reference to the fact that Dina didn't want to talk about her experiences. And it's well known all through Europe that people could not talk about their experiences. They had to go on with life. That was the experience. It's not, it wasn't a question of good or evil, of good people or bad people. These were people desperate for survival, which was such a positive life force 
But the, the question I have is that um, films, a film like this could not have been done in Germany. I know Tina Grossman had been doing a lot of historical research on the DP camps in Germany. A film like this could not have been done in Germany, in Poland, in France at that time. Eisenhower urged filmmakers to, to film in the concentration camps, but <coughs> those films were not seen and no one wanted to, to talk about it or see them. But I suspect that um, some of the funding for this film, and I, I would like to know if you know anything about that, came not only from the Jewish joint, but from many other groups that were trying to raise funds for Palestine. It was not ideological, it wasn't a question of good or bad. People had to leave those other countries. The people who tried to go back to their homes in Germany or Poland were killed after the war. You know, Italy was welcoming and it helped refugees um, in, the, in the kinder transports and in all of these uh, barricades against the British blockade. I mean, there was a tacit acceptance. So the funding, I suspect, was coming from, also from Italian sources, but from the, and the Jewish joint, but that they were trying to raise more money by such a film, that your father was in fact trying to raise money for the Zionist cause. Uh, no, no, I don't, I, don't th I don't think that that's the case, no. Uh, I, I know that Salvatore, I don't, you, Jenny, do you know if Salvatore's family gave money at all for this? I'm assuming that they did. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think there was no Jewish, formal Jewish involvement. I don't think the joint gave a penny. I don't think that the Zionists gave any money. I don't think it had anything to do with that. This was, this was a, a film of art. It, oh, it definitely was. But it was meant to be, and it wasn't. There wasn't money solicited from those areas. It it, it, it wasn't quite that. I don't really know. From what we have on paper, it seems that uh, Albert Salvatore is the uh, only producer, and we know that there was some sort of Italian-American oil connection that makes the story even more interesting. <laughs> 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 uh, well, well, I guess it's all which must have invested. And that is uh, looks the Italian right. producing company at this time uh, started having some money that was also coming from the production of other neorealistic films. So what, what we know from, from the few documents, and this is of course is open for research, is that Alberto Salvatore is the only producer listed, and, and, and that's what we know. Yeah, for sure. resources must have come from Luce, and uh, of course there was, I mean, was, we were at a time when there was the American government to pour money, in, to pour money into um, a film industry that has a very strong American interest in it in Italy. Uh, there is a whole issue of not wanting to return the Cinecittà studio and so forth. Um, so there is also a common interest in America and Italy to give a, a, a unified image of a country that not only had to be good because fascism had to be erased, but also because America could only have a good ally, could not have a bad ally. So it's, uh, I think there is a large combination of possibilities that are uh, worth exploring further. Where was the film actually shown? Oh, in America, World Theater and Broadway in 47th and 9th Street. And it had mixed reviews. And, and there was, as I said, there was not very much interest. So it was a commercial, in a commercial movie, and there wasn't much interest, but that those years were not good years for for a, for a film like this. This was not the kind of film they wanted to go and see. They weren't ready. Also, I just wanted to comment on one thing you said. Italy had no involvement with the Kingdom Transport. In fact, the only transport of children that should have left from Italy was stopped by the Vatican because it was it was they would you know want uh, Jews to go to Israel, which was. A sacred Hollyland. They stopped it because there were groups there was that went through Italy. Italy. There were children's groups that did go through Italy from that had been Viennese Jews, Jewish children. You mean that went survivors. through Italy and went to Palestine? Oh, no, so right. That was uh, when those were not in the transport. 
I think this is all the time we have. All right. Right. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. No, 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 the family has the right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there is uh, one of the reasons why it failed, I think, is because the film was done very oh, poorly done. That's true, too. Yeah, yeah there was, it was, that was mentioned in the review of the New York Times in for tonight. I just had a quick question. I wanted to know the story by Bassini. Is it a story or a novel? Basani. 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 It's a novel. It's a novel. It's a novel. Oh, this short story is one of the short stories. It's a short story in the novel. It's all no, the it's a separate short story. Okay, and what is the story called? Uh, the, the title is the name of this uh, protagonist. It's called the uh, Geo G E O uh, Jos J O S Z. J O S Z. I don't. I don't know the. the I think the, in English is the plaque. Well, I want to thank, uh, thank Wendy, you. Jennifer, the family. <laughs> and again, I want to thank our friends of, of Centro Primo Levi for uh, having helped us organize this together. It was a great project <laughs> to work <laughs> together. <laughs> And for those of you who are interested in participating in Professor Schwartz's uh, um, seminar, you might want to RSVP on the uh, Cento Primo Levi Center website. Uh, there, there are still a few seats. We're giving precedence to faculty and students of the New York area, uh, but uh, we're trying to open it up to more people. Thank you all again very, very much. Thank you.